Okay, we'll start with this. It appears that later on this month, on the 17th, Turkey's own unbeaten up-and-comer in the women's bantamweight division, Serene Satine, will be returning to action against an opponent that has yet to be announced, Serene Satine, who we talked about in my previous video, currently ranked at number one by way of the WBO. Last in action earlier this year for what was a WBC silver title, also at 118 pounds. She's ranked pretty highly with both alphabet organizations, sporting a professional record of 11 wins with no losses, no draws, seven knockouts, 26 years old with a, a decent looking resume for a fighter at this stage in her career. Decent, I say decent, because she has shared the ring with the likes of a former champion in Eva Voraberger, former EBU champion of Spain, Mary Romero. But you have to look a little bit closer. You have to dive a little bit deeper to get a better idea of where Serene Satine is. Serene, who was last in action in April of this year against Mary Romero, who I just mentioned, won that fight by the skin of her teeth. Not her best performance. I think she was quite fortunate to make it out of that fight with her unblemished record, her unblemished record intact. Don't know who she's gonna be fighting later on this month on the 17th because the fight doesn't appear to be registered on box rec, not yet. Sometimes that happens. See if she ends up facing. She needs more rounds in the bank. She needs more experience. Serene Satine has the look of a mid-range to inside pressure fighter. Still rough around the edges. She has her virtues. She's got youth, good height, good length for this weight, good shot selection. Offensively, she's gifted. Still very rough around the edges. Pressure fighters that are rough around the edges that still need more rounds and still need more work. They're basically brawlers. Maulers and swarmers. Those still pressure fighters accustomed to applying pressure and throwing punches and bunches. It's it's the difference between a David Lemieux and a Chocolatito. The difference between, say, a John Ryder and an Artur Betterbeef. Whilst both fighters are pressure fighters, they are competing at very different levels with that same base style and all of its underlying principles. That applies to Serene. I think we saw that play out in Serene Satine's last fight opposite the ring Spain zone, Mary Romero, who, like Serene Satine, is also a mid-range to inside pressure fighter, but is a more seasoned, experienced fighter overall, giving Serene Satine all she could handle was an all-action shootout. Most immediately, you could see that Serene Satine, in spite of her virtues and finer qualities, she wasn't accustomed to facing an opponent, an opponent like herself, who can push, who can push back. Many years younger than Mary Romero, though not more experienced. Mary, like Serene Satine, she is a mid-range to inside pressure fighter, a volume puncher, an aggressive one that likes to go for it. When she went for it with Serene Satine, Serene's energy reserves, her gas tank, she was spent. It's the little things. It's the little things that make all the difference. You will notice how Mary Romero angles off as she shoots the jab, keeping that head off center. Out of the way of Serene Satine's punches. Thereby enabling Mary to let her hands go without fear of being countered by Serene Satine, who's still very crude, still very static, and rough around the edges. That when letting her hands go, while she is gifted offensively, defensively, she's lacking. Punches aren't defensible. Shows a good variety of punches, often shows a good variety of punches, Serene Satine, but these are not always defensible punches, defensible shots. And not every girl's gonna crumble off the first hard shot that lands. That's what we saw in the Mary Romero fight. And Serene Satine's intestinal fortitude was tested in that fight. Hard to say that she passed with flying colors. I don't think she did. But if she's smart, she will have learned something from her predecessor Mary Romero, a pressure fighter like herself who you saw staying off the line, changing levels at times. On her way in. Bending at the waist, bending at the knees, angling off while she shoots the jab, effectively able to get within striking distance of Serene Satine. Safely. Without being in line for punches. If Serene Satine and her team are smart, they will have learned a thing or two from Mary Romero. Because while her and Mary Romero may share the same base style, Serene Satine leads a lot more more work than Mary does. Serene Satine has the look of a brawler. Best way to classify a limited pressure fighter, but still a pressure fighter of some ability with limitations. Those are your brawlers, your maulers, your swarmers, your Roman villas, your David Lemuse, your Miguel Bertolt. A limited pressure fighter of limited skill and nuance is a brawler. Serene Satine is a brawler. At least right now she is. Silver lining is she's young enough to change that. She's young enough to improve upon what she already has, improve upon that base style. We'll see what version of her 
we get on the 17th of this month, which is a little over a week from now. Ranked number one with the WBO holding a secondary title with the WBC, the silver title. Champion by way of both those alphabet organizations is Dina Thorsland. And while Serene Satine may be in line for Dina, she's not ready for Dina. Those eggs need more bacon. We'll see how Serene Satine checks out a little over a week from now. Men's Light Heavyweight News, the continued search sir, sir, for an opponent sir. for Dimitri Bivial. As Lyndon Arthur's trainer, Pat Barrett, says he wants his boxer to get more learning fights before facing the top names. <laughs> Pat Barrett guided his fighter and cousin, Lyndon Arthur, to the IBO Light Heavyweight title last weekend and sees no reason to change his methods now. There's plenty more to come, Barrett told Boxing Scene. This is about Lyndon learning the game at a different level. The IBO is a proper manufactured world title and it can open the door for many things. Here's what we know. Before Joshua Buatzi left Matchroom, unbeaten Olympian Joshua Buatzi, before he left the promotional outfit for Boxer, he was offered a fight with Dimitri Bivol, and he didn't take the deal. Why not? Well, according to Joshua Buatzi, it's because if he would have took the Bivol fight, it would have further extended his deal with Matchroom, and he didn't want to be on Matchroom anymore. He didn't want to be on DAZN. He wanted to go back to Sky. That's what he said. More recently, Dan Aziz who also fights on the Sky Sports and Boxer side of things, he was supposed to be in the running for a Dimitri Bivol fight, but then news broke that he was going to be facing Joshua Buatzi instead. That's what was said. So, Joshua Buatzi rejects the Bivol fight, as does Dan Aziz. They move on to Lyndon Arthur, who was in action not but a few days ago. Same deal. He didn't want it either. He needs to get more fights at this level and slowly bring him on before they look for unifications with the likes of Dimitri Bivol. He's 32. The former European and Junior Welterweight said, That's not the way to go. Let's defend this IBO title a few more times. Let's get some learning fights under his belt, like Chris Eubank did with his WBL belt years ago. Barry Hearn got him all the right fights and built him up. He defended that WBO belt about 20 times. Build him up on TV and let him get the following he deserves. They think they've got a world champion and they're going to do this and that and build him. They've got the platform and everything it takes. Let Lyndon be a superstar and make some money. Don't just jump into things and go to America straight away. It's a duck. Lyndon Arthur sports a professional record of 23 wins with just one loss. One loss, 16 knockouts. He's 32 years old and Pat Barrett's talking about him like he's a prospect. Seriously. Got nothing against Lyndon Arthur, but I ain't got no hair on my my tongue either when i read through this all i see is that he doesn't want to put him in there with dimitri because he knows he's gonna lose he knows there's domestic money to be made with fights like a dan aziz fight or maybe a joshua buatzi fight maybe he faces the winner of their fight over there on sky or maybe he has a rubber match with Anthony Yard. There's domestic money to be made in the United Kingdom for a light heavyweight without taking on Dimitri Bivol. Which perhaps doesn't pay life-altering money to begin with, but certainly more money than Lyndon Arthur made in his last fight. What they figure is the same thing that Joshua Buatzi figured. Why gamble with Dimitri Bivol? You can stay domestic. You can still make money and you can still fight on TV. You can still fight on television without having to deal with Dimitri Bivol. It's unfortunate what the light heavyweight division has become and what's happening to the career of Dimitri Bivol, who had the biggest year of his career last year, and nobody wants to deal with him this one. It's too good for his own good. As stated, Pat Barrett is talking about his fighter like he's 22 when he's 32. 32 years old. What do you mean you're going to build him up? So how old does he have to be before he's ready for Dimitri? Does he have to be in his mid to late 30s? Early 40s? Just doesn't want the fight. He doesn't want to say it out right because if he does that makes it a duck but he just doesn't want the fight he knows Lyndon doesn't stand much chance of succeeding and he knows there's other money to be made domestic money in the light heavyweight division that doesn't require Lyndon Arthur don't require him to fight somebody like Dimitri I'm not telling him what to do he can do whatever he wants to do and people are free to react to it however they want to react to it my reaction to it is it's a duck it's a plain old duck simple as that Downstairs in the men's super lightweight division, news broke yesterday that Teofimo Lopez is designated as WBO super champion by the WBO, allowing him all these special privileges, the designation. WBO super champions got perks, special privileges. Teofimo Lopez is now gone from retirement 
to reinstate a champion to upgrade a championship status all in a span of three months. The two-division and reigning lineal NWBO Junior Welterweight Champion was approved for super champion status by the WBO. The 24-person committee unanimously voted in favor of the designation request filed by top rank on behalf of Lopez, 19-1, with 13 knockouts. This committee strongly believes that Lopez substantially satisfies the requirements for such a recognition. WBO Championships Committee Chairman Luis Batista Salas noted in a ruling reached Saturday evening. Good for Teofimo. One key area under the WBO sought fit to approve the request were Lopez's wins over top fighters in two different weight divisions. Lopez defeated Vasil Lomachenko in their October 2020 lightweight championship unification in Las Vegas. He then delivered a sensational performance to dethrone unbeaten lineal WBO 140-pound champion Josh Taylor on June 10th at Madison Square Garden's Hulu Theater in New York City. Lopez's amateur record was also taken into consideration, where he claimed 380 wins in 452 amateur fights and represented Honduras in the 2016 Rio Olympics. This has already given rise to preliminary talks about a Crawford fight, at least some people that are interpreting this news that way but that's not actually what this is about additionally lopez held the wbo super champion status during his lightweight title reign in summary the above referenced accomplishments clearly satisfy the required criteria for designation as wbo super champion in the junior welterweight division noted salas this ain't about getting terence crawford in the ring terence crawford is bound to a spence rematch since spence activated his rematch clause rematch which most are tabbing to take place at junior middle, not Welter. So this move from Lopez, it's not about getting Terrence in the ring. Terrence couldn't fight him right now if he wanted to. It's not about that. Among the benefits afforded to a WBO super champion is the flexibility to extend the period between mandatory title defenses and the freedom to pursue more significant and legacy-defining fights. The designation also allows its claimants to petition for immediate mandatory challenger status in another weight division or even their own in the event they lose the physical WBO title in the ring or through other means. While it wasn't specified in the ruling, Lopez would theoretically have a clear path to enter the WBO welterweight rankings as the mandatory challenger if he opted to pursue a third divisional championship. Lopez has yet to announce his next move, or if he will even fight later on this year. He announced his retirement in the immediate wake of his terrific win over Josh Taylor, only to walk back that claim when the WBO called for clarification on his championship status and intention to defend the title. It has been theorized that he will headline a December 9th top-ranked show on ESPN at Madison Square Garden in New York City. top rank and ESPN annually present a show on that week which immediately follows the network's Heisman Trophy presentation to honor the top college football player. Heisman night, that's Teofimo's night. Elsewhere in a division, former champion Jose Ramirez and unbeaten up-and-comer Arnold Barboza have a September 19th purse bid scheduled for an ordered IBF title eliminator. Subriel Matias of Puerto Rico is IBF champion. For the second time this summer, a Jose Ramirez versus Arnold Barboza fight has been ordered by a sanctioning body to enter talks. The latest development came as a surprise to many in the industry when the IBF revealed that a September 19th hearing was scheduled to determine promotional rights for the junior welterweight title eliminator. Final eliminator. What's any of this got to do with Teofimo? Now, I don't think this fight is going to happen because I think Jose Ramirez will end up fighting Teofimo and not Arnold Barboza. Better still, on August 17th, 2023, the IBF ordered Jose Ramirez and Arnold Barboza to begin negotiations for the IBF Junior Welterweight Title Eliminator for number one. IBF Championships Committee Chairman Carlos Ortiz stated in an official letter obtained by BoxesScene.com an agreement could not be reached within the time frame allowed by the IBF. So the IBF is ordering a purse bid in these offices on Tuesday, September 19th, 2023. The winner will become the new 
new IBF junior welterweight mandatory contender if the fight happens. Subriel Matias is the reigning title holder, as previously reported by Boxing Scene. The Puerto Rican knockout artist is set to defend versus current mandatory challenger Shohan Ergashev on November 4th as part of a Showtime championship boxing telecast from a U.S. location to be determined. I'm not convinced that Barboza versus Ramirez happens because I'd sooner expect Jose to fight Teofimo in December. On Heisman night, you have to think about it. A fight with Arnold Barboza isn't for an actual title, it's for mandatory status. Whereas a fight with Teofimo, that would be for his old WBO title. And if nothing else, the fight with Teofimo would have more of a profile than the fight with Arnold. That's how this pertains to Teofimo. I don't expect Jose to fight Arnold because I'm expecting him to fight Teofimo. And if nothing else, you have to remember, Jose and Arnold are managed by the same guy. They've got the same manager, Rick Merrigan. I think if Rick could have it his way, he's not going to have two of his own guys fighting each other for peanuts on a dollar. Jose stands to make more money from a Lopez fight than a Barboza fight. Right. And this is to become who's mandatory challenger? Subriel Matias. Listen, Look. I've got nothing against Subriel Matias. I think he's an entertaining, fun fighter to watch. A powerhouse. But I don't get the sense that Ramirez is chomping at the bit to become his mandatory. Why would he do that when he can fight a guy like Teofimo straight away? On his own side of the street at that. On his own side of things, the top-ranked side of things, Subriel, he's over there at the PBC. I'm just bouncing ideas around. I'm just brainstorming. But I don't get the sense that fighting Arnold to get to Jose means more to Jose than fighting Teofimo. He can fight Teofimo straight away. How does all of this relate to Teofimo petitioning for WBO Super Champion status? More wiggle room. Time allotted for a WBO super champion as opposed to a regular one, a super champion gets a more extended period of time to satisfy mandatories. And to my knowledge, Teofimo doesn't even have one. Nope. None at this time. So he could probably fight Jose as a voluntary. As far as Teofimo potentially moving up in weight as the mandatory challenger to the title at 147, I don't think we're on the eve of that. That's something that we might see next year after Terence vacates the WBO and after after it goes to Alexis Rocha, at which point Golden Boy and Top Rank can make that fight amongst themselves. That's the end game. Teofimo's got options at 140, but now he also has options at 147. That's the play. It's not about getting Terence Crawford in the ring. Terence Crawford's on his way to 154, and he's got to fight Spence again. This is about getting in position to pick up his old belt. That's the play. And it's a smart play. 